Hi, Saurabh. Welcome to the Sensei Kujaku Show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me, Krish. Pleasure being here. So, Saurabh, I can only imagine how tired you are of answering the same questions over and over again in every interview, in every podcast. I can only imagine how frustrating is it, it is. Is it as frustrating as I think it is? Look, I've watched uh, MS Dhoni for a long time now. I'm a big Dhoni fan. And he's been answering questions on his retirement for the last 10 years. And he hasn't retired yet. And he seems to be very, you know, placid and very uh, 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 unruffled when people ask him on retirement. So if MS Dhoni can deal with retirement questions for 10 years in a row, I think I'm happy to answer questions on the same stocks and the same issues uh, year after year. It's part of the job. So, Sora, what do you think of HDFC Bank? <laughs> <laughs>
if even a chota bank blows up the regulator will get pilloried and the media the public will have a go at the regulator right so the world over uh, including in a, a communist country like china the regulator tends to be super risk averse especially if it's a, a, a fast growing high profile economy regulator tends to be petrified of bank failures now if you're a regulator in a petrified of bank failures what do you do you make it very hard for you make it very hard for new new banks to enter and if you make it very hard for new banks to enter then obviously amongst the incumbents the most competent who were up the who were up the market share right and that's exactly why uh, a jp morgan and a wells fargo are as dominant as they are in america it's why say a bank like hsbc uh, or lloyds bank uh, are as dominant as they are in the uk um, and similarly in china or icbc and the, the, the government owned banks will have 40 50% market share the top few banks in china will have the 40 50% market share you're showing so my reckoning is india will go like that unless the rbi suddenly becomes very brave and decides to let in every year half a dozen banks which i simply don't see happening unless the rbi decides to let in half a dozen banks or the powers that be in delhi make a call that we will allow industrial houses to come into banking which also i think is going to be a super controversial call so unless the powers that be in delhi or the rbi makes a uh, a, a sea change in the regulatory construct i think consolidation in banking continues at a very straight forward level uh, whether it's hdfc bank or indeed our investment in say kotak bank in some of our funds we also have icic and access the reason you want to be invested with the best private sector banks is given that there is barriers to entry uh the incumbents have three very powerful competitive advantages they are a getting liabilities at incredibly low costs even in the current even in the latest quarter if you see hdfc bank or icici banks cost the liability that's something like i think 4.6 4.7 right on average right between casa and and the wholesale market piece they are basically paying sub 5% for their for their cost of funds and they're lending that money out at 7 8% right at, at, at even for premium customers they're lending that money out at at 7 8% second advantage that that a, 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 a high quality private sector bank will have is given that they have mountains of data to analyze applying modern data analysis techniques applying ai uh, gives them privileged insights on to who are the best credits in the country right the more data you have the more powerful your data mining insights right so yes federal bank will have good insights from data mining but given that hdfc bank is 4 5x the size of federal bank their insights from data mining will be exponentially better right and the third benefit i think is this whole new regime around account aggregation i think it suits the larger lenders far more than it suits the smaller lender the larger lenders my senses are pinging away using the account aggregation regime getting getting customers uh, prospective customers to share their bank statement details so you might not be a icici bank customer you might be say an sbi customer but under under the account aggregation regime icici bank will request you to share your sbi account details and if icici bank or hdfc bank is the most proactive amongst the private sector banks their ability to sign up new customers using the account aggregator regime is disproportionately greater compared to say a, a psu bank so i think the regulatory regime uh, 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 fosters profit consolidation across the world if the banking regulator is risk averse and as i said there is no reason for the risk regulator to be anything other than risk averse in fact they have a posh name for this it's called prudential regulation one way of playing that is simply just buying the largest banks and banking on the fact that they will keep growing and sort of get a larger share of the pie could you also make the case that there is value to buying well run small banks under the assumption that over time they will be swallowed up and full value will be realized as the larger guys swallow them up So the so, so there is value to buying smaller banks but perhaps not for the reasons you mentioned Krish. Mm-hmm. So here is why the line of thought you gave right is somewhat counterintuitive to me. If a small bank agrees to be swallowed up it's usually when it's struggling right? So very rarely will a, a successful thriving small bank allow a larger bank to 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 gobble it up right? So I say if you go back all the way back to I think 2009 or 8 a bank of rajasthan was taken over by icici basically the rbi orchestrated that that marriage between uh, bank of rajasthan and icici bank right bank of rajasthan ran into some issues and so on 
right? So, so, so therefore, to invest in a small small bank and say, well, one day it'll get swallowed up. That's basically saying this guy will get into trouble, and then he'll be bailed out of trouble, right? So, yes, bank was bailed out by SBI, but I think shareholders pretty much lost everything uh, uh, they had. Um, I, re- I, 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 I reckon a better reason for buying smaller banks is we are we are a very heterogeneous country, we're a diverse country, and there are deep pockets of regional wealth where uh, the regional elite have affiliations to a local bank rather than to a national brand name like a SBI or an HDFC bank, right? So, for example, again, in, in our small cap portfolio, we have City Union Bank, right? So, uh, I've known these folks for a long time. Uh, um, they're a 110-year-old bank, uh, specifically focused uh, around Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Telangana, uh, and the elite in that part of the world affluent people have deep affinity for City Union Bank, right? So there are, I've met lots of private sector bankers who try to poach customers from City Union Bank and they could be offering interest rates 200, 300 bips better than what CUBK is offering, but the customer stays loyal to to CUBK. So when you see a regional franchise like that, provided they are keeping up with the times on technology, provided they've got uh, a good management team, uh, to my mind, it makes sense to lock into that, especially if it's a industrially, economically booming part of the country like Telangana, Andhra, Tamil Nadu is, right? So, so, so we bought City Union Bank, I think at 1.1 times or 1.2 times price to book. Their tier one ratio is 17, 18%, ROEs are 14, 15%. Uh, as I said, very loyal client base, and they've up- upgraded upgraded the technology, perhaps a little later than they should have, but they've upgraded the technology, uh, where they're now signing off on loans in two hours rather than 10 days, right? Uh, uh, so, so yes, regional banks make sense, provided they have a very regionally loyal client base, which is sticky, which gives them a comparative advantage. I remember a few years back, um, you know, towards the start of Marcellus's journey, you spoke a lot about how corporate profits in India are increasingly concentrated in the top 20, 30, 40 companies. And I think at its peak, it was maybe about 50, close to 60 percent. It went actually, at its peak, it went through 100 percent because in COVID, the smaller companies made no money and these large companies accounted for all of India's profits. But uh, yes, at its peak, it was 100 percent. And then uh, from that peak, it's come down to roughly 45 percent, right? And we are back to where we were in, say, 2017, 2018. Yeah. And it's you know it has been very interesting watching this trend, right? We so just to sort of put some numbers around this, 1991, 92, when we started liberalizing the country, the 20 largest companies accounted for only 15 percent of India's profits, mm-hmm. right? Seems incredible in, in in retrospect, just 15 percent, one five. By 2008, this number had reached around 25%. The 20 largest accounted for a quarter of India's profits in 2008. By 2018, the 25 had become something around 45, 50%. And then as I said, at the height of COVID, this almost hit 100%. Since then, it's subsided, subsided sharply. Smaller companies have done better. The top 20 have ceded profit share. And the top 20's profit share is now down to 45, 45% of the, of the economy, right? Um, now, at one level, from an from economic perspective, this is a good thing. Because if you have 20 companies and they're accounting for 70, 80, 90 percent of the country's profits, it's worrisome at many levels. It's worrisome because it suggests economic dominance. It worries some because it suggests lack of choice in the stock market, etc., etc. So, so it's good to see the profit share of the, of the top 20 come off. Now, the question for us as investors is why has it come off? Has it come off because the chota companies have done really well? Uh, has it come up because the big companies have done really badly, right? And I think, and I think basis what we are seeing over the last three years, the answer seems to be chota companies have done really well, right? So now another cut of government data, right? It's very, it's, it's one of the good things about India is the government publishes lots of data. You just have to be diligent in mining it. For roughly the, the decade up to 2020, right? Smaller companies, by smaller I mean, say profits below 300 CR. Right, so basically think of world below BSE 500, right? So there'll be um, not just listed, but tens of thousands of unlisted companies. So up to in the decade after 2020, these chota companies got absolutely plastered. Their profit growth, uh, there actually was no profit growth. Profit shrank pretty much consistently in the decade up to 2020. In the last three years, 
these companies have had a great time. Sub 300 crore profitability companies have had a great time. Now, why have they had a great time? Our working hypothesis is basically three things have worked out for Chota companies in the last three years. Pella is the banking system has been restored to health, right? So a lot of credit to the government for expediting the bankruptcy code, for recapitalizing banks, for going after uh, naughty promoters. Um, so Raghuram Rajan, Urjit Patel, Shakti Das, the folks in the finance ministry, enormous credit, right? This is one of, been the, one of the best repair jobs, I think, done on any big economy's banking sector. Tier one ratios are 17, 18%, the highest in the world. And banks are liberally lending money to SMEs. Right, especially for working capital finance, right? If an SME comes and tells me, boss, I working capital finance uh, in this circumstance, in today's day and age, I honestly don't know when you will ever get money, right? Project finance still a little bit of an issue, but working capital finance liberally available courtesy the restored health of the banking system. I think the second thing has been the rise of the India stack. So the combination of uh, social media giving you marketing access to the whole economy and UPI allowing you to get paid costlessly and UPI allowing smaller companies to get paid by the larger companies with much lower working capital cycles. Uh, I think that's been a massive boon for Chota companies, right? So, you know, even in our day-to-day -day lives, I can now see so many of my colleagues, they buy their clothes and their shoes online from vendors I've never heard of. And, you know, it's one thing is the youngsters are able to see a shoe, pair of shoes on Insta and they like it, they buy it there and then. So I think recently one of the sell side brokers, I think it was, it was a vendor's park, they did a report on that even in consumer goods, right, sort of the kind of stuff people like us buy, 50 odd billion dollars of activities happening from these online brands, right? 50 billion dollars is one and a half percent of GDP. That's quite a big deal. So that's the second, I think, plus uh, uh, that we've seen. And the third piece, which I think has really helped Chota companies is infrastructure generally has become significantly better in the post-GST world. So just think about the pre-GST world. Pre-GST world, every company would have its basically each state. They would have to have a distribution structure for that state, uh, a depot, dealers, distributors, because there was no pan-India economy, right? So GST freed up companies from having state-specific infrastructures. And secondly, the improvement of the highway network, the national highway network has doubled in 10 years. That's helped Chota companies, I think disproportionately more than it has helped larger companies, right? So combination of GST and improved infrastructure means as a small company, now you can procure your goods from wherever you like mm. and you can sell your goods to wherever you like. So I'll give you a classic example of this. So a couple of months ago, I was in a small town in UP called Najibabad. So, so for those who know the UP, there's this town called Bijnor. Bijnor is around three hours drive from Delhi. Najibabad is another hour from Bijnor, right? It's a tier four town. And I was meeting this youngster, 27, 28 year old guy. And I asked him, kya karte ho? So he says, I'll run an extruded aluminum products firm. So, you know, making aluminum frames for window, window, windows and so on. So I said, kitna purana hai firm? He says, char saal purana hai. I asked how turnover is, he says 65 crores and I fell off my chair. So I said, how do you do 65 crores of turnover in Najibabad, please help me understand. So he was telling me that they buy, their, uh, they buy scrap aluminum from Alang in Gujarat where ships are broken down. Right? Because of GST, they can bring their scrap from Alang in Gujarat to Najibabad in UP, smelt it, which will melt it and then uh, mold it into aluminum frames and sell that in the NCR market. Aligarh, Itwa, the small, a small town UP market um, and do 65 crores and he said, I'm branding, ka soch hon, right? Now imagine right, this youngster, it's not as if he comes from a big industrial family. He has, he has a family which are, who are dealers in cement and uh, uh, steel and sariya basically. But he's taken that one step further and rather than being a trader in cement and sariya, he's become a manufacturer using the new the new facilities available to SMEs in India, which is national procurement and national selling. So three very encouraging trends. Now the big question is, top 20 companies profit share has fallen in the last three years. Um, thankfully, top 20 companies continue growing their profits at a decent clip, 15 to 20%. But the smaller companies are doing really well in terms of profit growth. Question is now what happens over the next 10 years? Will the top 20 companies continue growing at 15, 20% and the smaller companies grow even faster? Or will the top 20 grow at 15, 20% and the smaller companies grow at say 10, 15%? Mm -hmm. I think the more likely outcome over the next 10, 15 years is the top 20 will grow at 
close to 15-20% in terms of profit growth because their ROCs are very high. Well-run companies like HDFC Bank, Titan, Asian Paints tend to have ROCs of 20-30%. Um, and they keep reinvesting enormous amounts of money. So I think well-run large companies will see profit compounding closer to the 20% mark. I think the SME community in totality will see profit compounding closer to the 10% mark. Remember, nominal GDP growth in India is around 10-11%, 10, and therefore the core of the economy, I think, will grow profits at around the 10% mark. And therefore, my, my reading is after the sharp reduction in profit share of the top 20 over the last three years, I think we'll once again see this uh, grind up in this number. Hopefully, it'll not get to those insane levels that we saw in 2020, which are not healthy, I think, for the country as a whole. So for the larger companies, do you think that they should be afraid of death by a thousand cuts? I think everybody should be afraid of competition in, in the Indian economy. I think it's become, the economy clearly has become far more competitive in the last three, four years. I think the post-COVID Indian economy, for the reasons that we discussed two minutes ago, is clearly more competitive than the Indian economy as it stood for the last 10, 15 years. I think we had a spurt of kind of entrepreneurial uh, activity 2004 to 9 and then that sort of died off and we had sort of 10 years of various issues banking system going through challenge the whole reframing of the regulatory construct around nclt gst um, so so entrepreneurial activity has 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 picked up uh, the capex cycle has picked up each company is looking over its over its uh, at its neighbor and saying can i copy him and make some more money Right? So I think everybody in India should be hyper, hyper aware that the competitive intensity has picked up. I think it will pick up even further. Return on capital will come under pressure as competitive int intensity picks up. The customer, I think, will get an be even better deal. The customer will get an even better deal in the years to come. So just using, say, our industry as an example, right? So, so we are a PMS provider. Uh, uh, I'm part of the trade body for our industry. We have, I think, 410 PMSs registered with SEBI. If you look at the SEBI data, six, seven years ago, there were barely 300, right? So just in our industry, we're adding 20, 25 PMSs a year. And these are, you know, these are not fly-by-night operations. These are people who are, say, quitting jobs in established asset management franchises, setting up their own PMS. Um, similarly, if you look at the number of mutual fund houses, I think that'll carry on rising. Um, so competitive intensity, whether in asset management, or uh, or in consumer goods is going to rise. The only exception I would say is sectors where the regulator simply doesn't want to let too many entrants in because of prudential reasons. I think banking stands out in that regard. Similarly, hazardous chemicals stands out. I don't think the country will say, okay, everybody open up your hazardous chemical shop. I hope the country doesn't do that. So sectors where the regulator stands at the door and doesn't let new people in, you will you should see ROCs hold up nicely. Um, but other than that, most other places you should see competitive intensity rise and therefore every promoter in India, every CEO has to get their act together and one of the things we look out for as investors is hardworking, switched on promoters and CEOs who are putting in, who are burning the midnight oil to figure out how to make their franchises leaner, smarter, better, fitter. And are you seeing any signs of concentration in CapEx? And what I mean by that is that for certain industries especially, there's only like three guys who can even think of playing in that field, simply because they're the only guys who can raise that kind of money or deploy that kind of money. So, so look, I mean, it's, uh, it's still very early in the CapEx cycle. So let's think this through. The banking system basically got destroyed from roughly 2007 through to 2000. 12, 13, right? The, the lot of capital got eroded, I would say, um, hundreds of billions of dollars of capital got eroded through NPAs, right? <clears throat> the repair of the banking system took till 2018, 2019. Before the, much could be done, COVID struck. So, 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 so in the aftermath of COVID, so if you take the last three and a half, four years, government capex has doubled every year the government is basically if you look at the budget the fm jacks up government capex by roughly 30 percent every year so therefore in the aftermath of covid in the last three and a half four years government capex has actually more than doubled okay private sector capex hasn't really doubled since then in fact if you look at the listed companies results you'll see that the psus right uh, the psus 
uh, and I'm not and, and I don't know whether in the capex data the PSU capex gets counted as government capex or private sector capex the PSUs have been at the vanguard amongst the listed companies what, what do you think how do you think it should be accounted right um, uh, I would say the PSU capex should be counted as government capex but I, I haven't found out whether uh, it gets counted as government capex I think the government capex is when a ministry spends money on roads that's what's counted as government capex but if say coal India spends money it's gets counted as private sector capex right so so the, so so just let's just just to peel the layers of the onion here private sector capex is more than government capex is more than doubled uh, uh, in the last four years PSU capex is up by 60-70% cumulatively mm. using the listed listed PSU's numbers. PSU capex is up by 60-70% mm. in the last three years or so. Then there's a group of three or four private sector companies who are fairly close to the establishment in Delhi. Mm. Their capex is up around 50-60%, mm. right? And then the rest of the world, the rest of the private sector, CapEx has only started stirring in the last 12 months, right? So in the last 12 months, you're seeing the regular private sector CapEx by companies who are not proximate to the seat of power in Delhi. They have started getting the act together in the last, I would say, two years. And, and I think we are, we, are, we are going to see a proper private sector CapEx cycle, leaving aside PSUs, leaving aside Government of India, leaving aside companies very close to the dispensation in Delhi, I think we'll see a proper private sector capex cycle over the next three or four years because these companies, A, have very strong balance sheets. You can see the cash sitting on the balance sheet. B, they have access to bank funding. The bank's balance sheets are also groaning with capital. C, um, there is, it's reasonably clear to most people in the country now mm. that the government is pro pro-business, pro-industry, and if you have this economic opportunity, you should go and capitalize on it. Um, and, and, and I think that combination of you have a good balance sheet, the banks have money, and the government is pro-business, I think will lead to a proper private sector capex cycle. We're seeing this already pretty clearly in South India. So, so I've been visiting say places like Coimbatore, Hyderabad, Vijayawada, Chennai recently, and you can clearly see this CapEx cycle kicking into gear. Similarly, if you visit places like Baroda, Rajkot, Gujarat, I'm talking about Baroda, Rajkot, you can see it kicking into high gear. So, so I think signs are good that we will see a proper conventional private sector CapEx cycle distinct from what the PSUs and the government is doing. How does an investor benefit from a CapEx cycle in the private sector? So what I mean is that if everybody is investing in CapEx, yeah and it just ends up becoming an arms race yeah. do you as an investor in that company yeah so this is where this is why you know we keep banging on about barriers to entry so let me give you the most simple example a lot of clients ask me boss real estate mein kyun nahi lagate real estate stocks kyun nahi lete right and we keep trying to explain to our clients and to whoever else is interested that a real estate developer has no barriers to entry right you could be the finest developer in bangalore bombay delhi but you have no barriers to entry Right. So, so if you see the Bombay market, um, since we live in Bombay, it's easy for me to explain. You just step out and you'll see every fourth building is either being redeveloped or there's a new new tower coming up there. Right. So, so supply and demand in city like Bombay, unless the, there's some very, you know, very cunning way to stop supply, which I haven't come across yet. Uh, supply and demand will uh, equilibrate and it's very difficult for a real estate developer to make a return on capital meaningfully above his cost of capital. Mm -hmm. Another way to answer the same question, look at the cash flow statements of real estate developers, right? Mm -hmm. There is no free cash flow, right? Operating cash flow and investing cash flow broadly cancel out and very, very difficult for even a really high class developer to generate surplus cash. If you don't generate surplus cash, you have nothing with which to grow your business, right? So, so, the, so, so return on capital not exceeding say 15-16% is much the same as saying very difficult to generate cash and therefore even in a real estate boom, you're not going to make that much money if you invest in the shares of a listed real estate developer, right? So how do you make money from real estate? You look for the barrier, you look for parts of the real estate sector where there are barriers to entry. And the easiest parts we have found historically are plays like Asian Paints, Pedalite, Astral Poly, Serra Sanitary Wear, right? You take sectors which are, uh, which are supplying critical inputs into the real estate sector. Um, say, let's take tiles for instance, right? Um, uh, in tiles, Kajaria is the leader. We are not an investor in Kajaria, but but if you, are, if you speak to an architect or interior decorator, they will say, if I'm 
if I am recommending to a real estate developer that you should be putting tiles here, I will have Kajari on a, on a list of say two to three tile providers, right? Similarly, if uh, if it's a uh, uh, affordable housing project, Sera Sanitary Ware is almost certain to be on that short list of one or two sanitary or providers that the architect or uh, interior developer will recommend to the contractor, right? Similarly for Astral Poly and CPVC pipe, right? So you look for uh, parts of the real estate sector, look for ancillary supplies to the real estate sector where there are barriers to entry. Similarly, in the broader capex story, right? A lot of people say, "Boss, sadak pe kyun nahi paisa lagate?" But invest in some EPC developer, EPC contractor who's building roads. And once again, I say that L1 chalta hai wahan pe. How on earth will you make any money building roads for NHAI or for the state government? Because it's an L1 process. The whole process of bidding for um, for 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 road contracts is intended to squeeze your roki. So, so instead of that, look for suppliers into the infra build who have moats, right? So, for example, um, we have invested in a company called uh, Tega uh, in our small cap portfolio. Tega, uh, uh, Tega makes the Tega makes mill liners. Tega makes mill liners, uh, which are used by the copper and uh, copper and gold miners of the world. Right? So Tega has a specific patent around a certain type of mill liner. There are four large players in the world in mill liners. Tega is the fourth largest, but it's the only one to have a patent for mill liners, which are a mixture of rubber and steel. Right? So as, as copper comes in, co copper is required for the EV industry, as copper enters a bull market, rather than trying to play copper, rather than playing a copper miner, you invest in Tega and you make money from the bull run in copper and gold prices. Copper and gold mines find it very useful to use Tega's mill liners. Mills, by the way, is where say big hunks of rock are crushed into a powder and from that powder, the, the gold and the copper is pulled out. So you need um, mills to go round and round and crush the ore into, uh, into rock. By the way, so out of a one ton of, out of one ton of gold ore, you'll get five grams of gold so out of one ton of ore aapko 5 gram sona milega mm. right so so it's quite a big deal you have to take the huge one ton of rock and smash it for that 5 gram of sona to smash that you need a mill so that the mill doesn't get broken you need mill liners to buffer the pressure on the mill and tega has a patent around some of the best mill liners in the world so so something as straightforward as ev ka boom mm. rather than going and buying uh, koi ev you are buying batteries, neither of which I think will have a competitive advantage. You figure out what will be required for the EV boom, which is copper. And then on copper, you require, figure out what is required to mine copper and Tega's mill liners fall into that category. Similarly, steel may boom chal rai, right? We're in the, hopefully we're in the early phases of what will be another three, four years of, of, of extended capex. Steel volume growth as per the government data is anywhere between 12 to 17, 18%. We know from the disclosures of Tata Steel and JSW Steel and sale that plants are running at 80-90% and therefore it is but obvious there will be another wave of steel capex, new plants are going to get built. Um, now if you build a steel plant, steel itself may steel itself is not going to give you Roki far above cost of capital. But when you build a steel plant, you need a furnace and to line the walls of the furnace, you need something called refractory tiles, right? These are uh, tiles with magnesium inside it so that the walls of the furnace don't melt even at 1500 degrees Celsius. So RHI Magnesita has 40% of this market of refractory tiles. It's a world leader. It's uh, based out of Austria. The Indian subsidiary uh, has 40% share in India. So you invest in RHI Magnesita to make money from the steel capex boom. So that's how we've tried to think through capex rather than saying, Chalo, let's buy a steel company or an aluminum company or a real estate developer or a road builder all of which is very exciting because wo announce karega apna order book full gaya market will pump the stock up five percent and it'll feel a lot of fun the only challenge is once you've done all of that and you open the cash flow statement you'll see cash flow nahi dikh raha yaar. but do you, do you think do you think people care that much about cash flow as long as the profit number keeps going up as long as eps keeps going up stocks seem to so go up. right in the short run they don't but remember, in the long run, if you have to business grow karna hai, to Bhagwan to paise dega nahi aapko. You have to reinvest. You have to reinvest your accrued surpluses to grow the business. Now, if you don't generate cash flow, 
you can do one of uh, two things. You can borrow money from the bank. Uh, and if you, do, if you borrow money from the bank for project financing, A, that's still pretty hard in India. Banks are shit scared in India of project financing. And even if the bank does lend to you for project financing, you say 9% le lega, right? If you're a small company, you can take 10 sakta hai. So if a project is going to yield 17, 18% and you're going to give half of that to the bank, then I as a shareholder only get half the value from your project, right? So that's the one way to do it, that you don't generate cash yourself. You go to the bank and say, boss, I need money, I'm getting a contract mil hai, ya project. Mil hai. If you're a good company, you'll get finance, but half the upside will go to the uh, lender. Second is you dilute. You issue new shares. You try to whip your share price into a frenzy and get it to 80 times earnings. Um, you know, get some analysts to write some really aggressive buy notes, whip it up to 80 times earnings. And, um, you know, issue shares at very high P. Effectively, an 80 P means your cost of capital is down to less than 2%. Uh, if you can do that, all in all credit to you, but my reckoning is the market will catch on to this, that this fellow, every time the economy heats up, he, he, he pushes the share price up and raises money and therefore over time, the stock price compounding gets damaged. Uh, we prefer to keep life simple. We prefer to look for companies where rookies are even in fast growing, reasonably capital intensive industries like mill liners, like uh, 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 refractory material. These are reasonably capital intensive industries. We look for companies whose rookies are 20% uh, plus. That means they can finance their growth through internal accruals. The need for issuing fresh capital is reduced. Um, and, and that gives us straight line of sight that as the capex cycle picks up, these companies can compound for us at roughly the 20%. They compound their profits at the 20% mark, which means our clients compound their wealth at the 20% mark. I find that a much simpler way to profit from the capex cycle rather than the guessing game around bank, kitne bidega aapko financing, aapki QIP, kitne valuation pe hogi. Right. Saurabh, I, I now want to ask you what I think may be an unfair question. Mm -hmm. And unfair because I think it requires you to psychoanalyze your own subconscious mind. Okay. So, in your, so you know, you've been for a long time very vocal about what you like and what you don't like, mm -hmm. whether it's industries or even individual companies. And you have multiple times on public plat platforms gone out and said, okay, I like ABC company and I don't like, say, XYZ company or XYZ industry. Now, as an investor, does doing that so publicly, do you think at any level it either restricts or even at some level? hampers your ability to change your mind. So it could be that you like ABC historically, but you may change your mind, but then it's almost as a, you know, what are people going to say if I've since said like ABC and now I'm changing my mind, how does it look? Or the flip side where I said, I don't like XYZ, but now if I buy it, what will people think? Sure. So, so before I answer that again, everything I've mentioned so far, right? every share uh, we own through our PMS, I'm invested in, a, in, a, in our PMSs, so my parents or our clients. So, so with that disclaimer, let me try to answer that question. I think the, what we have tried to do, and I, and I wish more people did this, is we've tried to be very transparent. Mm -hmm. So obviously, as per the PMS regs, we have to be transparent with our clients. So every month they get statements, the clients have username, password, they can log in and check the portfolio all the time. But I feel it's equally important to be transparent with your prospective clients. Right now, if I only talk about you know a few winners and not the losers, and I only talk about what we're going to do, what what we're not going to do, I'm not I'm not sure I'm being fair on the transparency side, right? So from the day we built the firm, we said we'll try to build a business where we're being very clear with people what we stand for. So if somebody out there says, well, sort of, I really want to participate in this capex cycle and i really don't care what sort of promoter you invest with as long as boss share price upar jai i don't care we want to tell that client we are not your kind of firm right and i would not rather even not have that conversation so that by watching this podcast or reading our books he can figure out that these guys are not going to invest with a, a certain type of promote, promoter who compromises on governance and ethics to capitalize on the capex cycle right so so by being clear on where where what we stand for we try to reduce the chances that a client comes to us 
thinking that Dhanadhan fatafat paisa banega, let me just get in. Uh, because, you know, it's, we are still a very young uh, stock market. There's still a, a, a whole generation of investors who have historically spent their entire life savings or invested their entire life savings in real estate and gold, right? Uh, as per the RBI data, 95% of household wealth in India is real estate and gold. So I think it's important for our industry at this juncture to be very transparent about what is your style, A, what is it that you'll invest in? What is it that you won't invest in? Because by doing that, we are being as transparent as possible to people out there. It's a big country and 90% of people are probably going to say the Marcellus style of investing, where they invest with clean promoters is not for us. We just want to make money. We don't really care whether the promoter is clean or otherwise, right? Now let's come to the psychoanalysis piece. Right? So part of the psychoanalysis obviously hurts us. You're right, right? Say, um, uh, for example, I mentioned RHI Magnesita to you a couple of minutes back. RHI Magnesita shares are down 25%, right? Uh, we think we understand why they're down 25%. We're not particularly perturbed by it. We, we keep doing our channel checks, talk to management. We believe the company will do well. But say, year from now, the capex cycle either fizzles out in India, steel demand drops off, or there's a radical jump in competitive intensity in the refractory sector. The Chinese start dumping refractories in India. If their economy tanks in China, I'm sure the Chinese will dump further in India. And say a year hence, we find ourselves in a difficult position on, on our, our RHI holding. Um, say the company's profits refuse to move upwards and the shares are sliding. Does it make an entry harder? I think it does at some level. Um, because we know that as soon as we exit, 25 people will start you know, jumping up and down. But at the same time, I'll say that we've seen this for so long. I've lived in India now for, for 16 years. I've been doing this sort of work for more than two decades. And this is a core group of people. We've worked together for two decades. We've seen people jump and down across multiple countries, uh, across multiple industries and what we do. That we've almost stopped losing any sleep about what other people are saying about what Marcellus is uh, buying or selling, right? So I think it was a year or so back, people went wild about our Relaxo exit, uh, as if no fund manager before us had ever sold a stock. And uh, you know, our sales team got lots of calls saying, boss, Relaxo, um, uh, uh In fact, uh, my, my, my parents are also my clients, so they, the retired folks in the UK, um, they, they saw on their YouTube feed that some video where I'm talking about the relaxed exit and they called my mom called up to say my god is this a is this a major event should we be worried I said no it's a good company we made a lot of money in relaxo we have huge admiration for Mr. Dua and the team but for a variety of reasons life has become tough for the low end of the Hawaii chappal business and hence we exited right so we don't lose that much sleep the biggest benefit of doing this right is it keeps us on the straight and the narrow, right? Um, a lot of people come to us and say, why don't you invest in crooked companies, right? So this look, look at this crooked company share price, it's trebled. Why don't you invest in that, right? Um, uh, and, you know, fortunately, we get to work with some of the most affluent investors in India and some of the increasingly courtesy our expansion in the West we get to work with some of the most powerful in institutional investors in the Western world. So they, are, they, are, they also ask this question, why are you so focused on ethics? Just go with whatever makes money, right? And that's where having this publicly stated position helps. Because implicitly they also understand that if we have laid the marker down that we will not invest in com companies with weak ethics and weak corporate governance, then they as a prospective client can't push us beyond a point because they know that this is how the shop has been set up, right? Um, um, so, so putting the marker out there helps clarify our own thinking when we are under duress as to why we aren't investing in companies with less than ideal governance and ethics. And um, uh, we published the data, uh, uh, we're happy to publish it again. In a typical five to six year cycle in India, you will have two, sometimes three years where the rubbish companies do really well. And that's when you need to have this publicly stated position. That's when your own, that's where you're having tied your hands helps you the most. That I have stated publicly that we'll try our best to avoid uh, companies with less than ideal governance. Um, we are also fallible. Maybe there'll be cases we'll get it wrong, but the attempt will be to avoid companies where 
our forensic analysis suggests naughty stuff has happened in the past. Yes, the shares have rode up, tripled, doubled in the last two to three years, but really that doesn't have that much bearing on our thinking. Having that stated position helps in discussions with investors, where the, investors partic- where the investor can be particularly pushy, mm-hmm. saying, I've seen a lot of people refer to you slash accuse you of being a buy at any price investor. A, do you think that that is that you are in fact a buy at any price or do you think there's any any sort of semblance of reality in that? And B, do you think people tend to relish your, when things don't work out for you, they tend to relish it more than they do for any other fund manager? So uh, you'll have to ask others what they, <laughs> whether they relish. I can only answer the question from our perspective. Um, um, so, so, so let's look at the flagship product. Right? I'll, I'll go through a few of our funds performance so that we can deal with this question rationally rather than through uh, my, uh, my uh, invective. Um, so the flagship product CCP is now five and a half years old. Um, net of fees is generated roughly 16, 16 and a half percent right over the five and a half years. Mm-hmm. Earnings growth for the underlying stocks turnover is pretty low in CCP right so it's a 16, 17 stock portfolio. We barely buy one or two stocks a year. So it's a pretty stable portfolio. Turnover is around 15%, which means a typical company stays in the portfolio for six years or so. So it's a pretty stable portfolio. Um, five and a half years of doing it in Marcellus. Returns are around the 16% mark net of fees. If you take it gross of fees, returns will be around the 18% mark. If you look, look at underlying earnings growth for those companies, they've been around 18-19%. Right? So so, so over that five and a half year period, P's went from roughly 37, 38 in December 2018 when we started the firm. They went all the way up to 55 times in Jan 22. Mm-hmm. Then from Jan 22 to March 23, the P's fell because the portfolio corrected sharply. Um, and roughly today, the P's stands where it was five years ago. So P went up, P went down. And therefore, the main driver of compounding in CCP was earnings growth. Earnings growth was around 18%, knock off the fees, and you get to around 16% client level compounding on that. Uh, uh, if you now come to our, our uh, global compounders portfolio, which we started the best part of, I think, now 20 months ago, that's compounded at netto fees, that's compounded at the 31, 32% mark. Um, their PE growth has been uh, both rupee and dollar has been same because the currency thankfully is state stable. So, so I'm talking in rupee terms. EPS growth in that portfolio has been around 24-25%. There's been a little bit of a PE improvement because when we started in October 22 mm-hmm. to now, PEs of those portfolios of those stocks have gone up a little bit. So, global compounders um, out of the 32% that we're generating, the vast majority is coming from EPS growth and a little bit of PE re-rating, right? Um, if you look at our Merit or Q, our Quant PMS, um, um, their compounding has been in the last 18, it is around 19 months old, compounding has been around the 20% mark, same maths again, earnings compounding 20, uh, EPS compounding, uh, earnings compounding 20 um, and share price compounding around 20. Right, so these three portfolios have done well. Now let's come to the portfolios which haven't done well. Uh, Little Champs had a great run from birth in August 19 till September 22, right? EPS compounding was 25%, portfolio compounded at 32%. PEs rose, PEs rose from birth in August 19 for the first three years, PEs rose. Um, From September 22 to now, Little Champs has not made any money. It's underperformed the SN, uh, uh, underperformed both BSE 500 and BSE small cap. But the P's haven't come off. What's happened to Little Champs is profit growth has disappeared, right? So our failure with Little Champs over the last one and a half years has been that over five, six quarters, profits have not come, profits have not grown at all. And the portfolio therefore has tanked. P's ironically for Little Champs are where they were one and a half years ago, right? So the point I'm driving at is, um, it doesn't take a huge amount of research to figure out what's the what at what value should you completely avoid a stock mm-hmm. right what it takes a lot of courage to do is look at a p and realize that this looks optically high 
And if you do the underlying work on this, it's actually not that expensive, right? And, and that takes a lot of courage to do because you, you know that if you buy that stock and it comes off on you, then clients will be disappointed and your critics will be happy, right? So a classic example of this was our entry into Trent in August last year, right? So we researched it with met management over several years and our bugbear had been that beyond uh, West Side, they were not making money in their other, other uh, uh, beyond West Side and Zara, they were not making money in their other retail offerings. But by August last year, we realized that Zudio was a very powerful uh, offering in the mass market. And uh, we built that position. And you know we spent a lot of time deliberating this whole PE multiple business, right? Because even by August last year, West Side was 70, 80 on PE. But when we did the math and we unpeeled onions on our, our EPS forecasts, which were significantly ahead of consensus, mm -hmm. on our EPS forecasts, the PE was coming out to be around the 40, 45 mark, not the 70, 80 mark, right? So we bought West Side in August last year. Between August and November last year, the stock went up, I think, around 30, 40%, right? In November, we doubled the position after the stock having risen, right? And again, the same discussion ensued, RRV being foolish, suicidal in buying in buying stocks with uh, high PEs. And again, the, the research suggested that our EPS estimates, our forward-looking EPS estimates are rising even faster than consensus. As consensus, I still don't think, has fully understood what uh, uh, the West Side team is doing or the Trent team is doing. And hence, we doubled the position in Trent in November last year when the PE was optically at least north of 100. Now, now you know, the position has doubled on us in seven, eight months. We have to think about what we do with that position now. But the point I'm driving at is, you will typically make money in investing when you make calls which to other people look suicidal. This is similar to say, our trebling our Bajaj Finance position in May 2020, when the stock was down 65% in four months. We trebled the Bajaj Finance position. You could argue the PE was infinite then because it was not even obvious that in the year ending March 21, Bajaj Finance was going to make a heck of a lot of money, if anything at all, right? So you'll typically make money in investing when you do things which appear to other people to be super tough to the point of being crazy. Um, and your job as an investor is to do the underlying work, do the maths and figure out whether, whether the odds are in your favor. If they are in your favor, you go ahead and do it. If you get it wrong, then you know, tell the whole world we've got it wrong. And if other people get some joy out of having go at you, then you know, good for them. Just quickly, what do you think has worked for Zudio? So I think what they've been able to figure out is this is somewhat akin to Asian Paints. Right? Remember in Asian Paints, what we've tried to tell the world is our reading is what Asian Paints does, which no other paint company is able to do is drive turns of four times at the dealer level. So every day, dealer ka, dealer ka inventory is turned three to four times. As a result, even though per liter, mm. per liter the dealer makes the lowest amount from any from Asian paint than from any other paint company. Per liter, the, Asian, the dealer probably makes only a couple of rupees. Mm. Whereas say, um, some of the other large paint companies are giving the dealer 10, 11 rupees per liter, mm. right? So even though the dealer is making less per liter, mm. because the turns are so rapid, mm. uh, every dealer wants to stock Asian paints because every two to three hours, the entire inventory is getting cleaned out, right? And that's very difficult for other paint companies to replicate because mm. you need to have incredible knowledge, clarity on dealer demand, mm. right? But remember there are 10,000 SKUs in this industry. So to know exactly how many SKUs should be sent to the Pedder Road dealer at 11 o'clock this Monday, is something that other paint companies simply wouldn't have that granularity of demand, right? What I think Trent has done, Azudio has done, very cleverly is taken that insight and brought it to uh, apparel retailing, mm. where over a 15 day period, they're cleaning out the entire store ka inventory, mm. right? No other apparel retailer has been able to get uh, inventory turns at this level. Our reckoning is inventory turns for Zudios are three to five X faster than any apparel retailer has historically achieved in India. Now, how exactly have they done it? Um, we're not 100% sure we've nailed the secret sauce, but what it's clear from going, from visiting dozens and dozens of Zudio stores, what's clear to us is turns are radically faster mm. than what any retailer in India has hitherto achieved. Uh, and remember, it's the, uh, it's the turns are the 
uh, kind of financial manifestation of it, right? The fact that the, the clothes fl fly through faster through Zudio to build a backend which can refresh the entire inventory every 15 days. New designs, high quality designs, designs which will sell both in Rajkot and in Raipur and in you know uh, Hyderabad, right? Uh, it takes enormous amount of analytics, supply chain work, procurement work. Um, and that's why I think it's gonna be a very difficult mode for others to replicate. And by the time others have replicated it, I think these guys will be north of 2,000 stores for Zudio. It's remarkable. I mean, you know, I think of companies like, so you mentioned, mentioned Asian Paints also in this answer. And the kind of supply chain logistics operation that they have to run. I mean, if you're saying every few hours, essentially someone's inventory is being turned. I mean, for, I mean, it's a, it sounds very silly, but I would imagine that the road is just filled with like Asian Paints trucks moving right. around. So how, how, what do you think? Do you think that that is a less understood competitive advantage that some of these companies So I'll go to the even deeper insight. See, one of the things we've realized is the investee companies that we back, they seldom open their mouth in public, right? Whereas the companies who have no free cash flows, they're yabbering away 24-7. So what that does is it gives the stock market a peculiarly distorted feel, where the, the, the lower the competitive advantage, mm -hmm. the weaker the rookies, the weaker the free cash flows, the more the PR the more the hype around the company, the greater the, the greater the overvaluation. And the deeper the franchise strength, the greater the free cash flows, the lower the reliance on the stock market for incremental funding, the more secretive the promoter, the lower the, uh, the, lower the hype around the company and the more discount to fair value that you're getting it at, right? And it's, it's, I think it's a delicious, delicious paradox of the stock market. And it's a paradox which is, I think, it, uh, 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 designed beautifully for you know discerning investors to be able to load up and and make money um, and and when you have markets like the last couple of years when narratives are very strong people are people are applying their heads less that they're, they're investing more with their emotions around macro narratives around you know country doing really well naturally the companies with greater hype mm -hmm. will show better share price performance the companies with lesser hype and therefore, the companies with lesser hype are available to you at discounted valuations and you, and you load up. You don't let the share price narrate, uh, dictate to you what you should do. You said that if HDFC Bank is available sasta, uh, as Bajaj Finance was at the peak of the COVID panic, as Divi's lab was when they announced in Feb 22 that COVID was over and that Mollo Piravir was not going to be a big source of revenues in the future. So when you see everybody else slamming that stock down, and you've done your work, you've done detailed research, that's when you double, treble, quadruple the position. Um, it doesn't work out every time, but more often than not, it works out and it allows you to compound for your clients at, at healthy, at healthy mid-teens to high teens and large caps. And hopefully, uh, we'll get back to compounding in low 20s and small caps. You, you see this dichotomy in investors as well, right? I feel like the ones who keep talking about how much money they're making, I don't know how much they're actually right. making. And the, the guys who keep talking about, boss, paisa banta hi nahi hai. Everything I buy is down, but right. every year there's a new S-class coming. So, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think S-classes are coming for us. I don't have a car, by the way. I don't have a car. I use local taxis. But, uh, but... In our lives, we've, we've, we've not lost too much sleep about transparency and performance because I go back to the cores again. We've had too much, you know, we've had too many precedents in our industry where fund managers talk up the things which have worked well for them and they're remarkably wary of sharing stuff that hasn't worked out, which I don't think is gives a fair picture of their product for someone who's not yet a client. Someone who's already a client can see your damn portfolio and figure out kya chala hai, nahi chala hai, right? But if you keep doing sort of, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, superficial marketing about the winners in your portfolio, and you try to convey an image that nothing has uh, failed in your portfolio, I don't think it's particularly fair on the, on the prospective client. Saurabh, I just want to end with one question. I want to know who you consider exceptional investors, I, I don't just mean in India, I mean anywhere in the world where they could be active investors or even someone historically, who do you look up to in this space? So look, I mean, in India, we've learned a lot from several investors, um, people we've, we've thankfully had the benefit of interacting with would be say Bharat Bhai at 
at ASK. I think the whole construct he's built at ASK around high quality investing, um, whether it, whether the bull market is favoring high quality stocks or the bull market is favoring low quality stocks, Bharat Bhai has, I think, set down a marker for for a generation of investors like us saying, do the right thing and um, the results will follow. Uh, from a different school of thought, but I think equally effective and equally clear in his communication, Shankaran Narain at ICICI Prudential. Um, uh, you know, he's been, he's made no bones about the fact that he belongs to say the Howard Marks school of thought where uh, buying things as the understanding cycles is seen as, as a big, as a big deal. And we've tried to learn from Narain and from Howard Marks how to understand cycles better. Um, so for example, as you know, when we discuss say um, RHI Magnesita, as good as they are and as good as, as, as much as I hope I'll make money from them, if the steel cycle turns down, RHI Magnesita will suffer and therefore my colleagues and I need to understand how to understand how to read the steel cycle. Right? So so Narain from from a perspective of understand cycles, understand value investing. Um, uh, um, Rukshal Shroff used to be at JF Asset Management in Hong Kong. He's retired uh, after running JF's India Fund for I think a couple of decades. He's a, he's a mentor to us. He's, he's taught us that look for cycles when even superficially there doesn't look to be one. So for example, till, um, till COVID, I would have never believed API, active pharmaceutical ingredients could have a cycle. But COVID showed us that even API companies like Divi's have a cycle, right? Something that you thought was, you know, was a secular industry, turns out to be a, a cyclical, uh, cyclical industry. So Rukshad said, if you look at an industry and you're seeing the market leader making 35% rookie, mm -hmm. and he's never made a 35% rookie before, don't convince yourself that boss has done something structural. Kiya hai. Look for whether there's a, uh, whether there's a cycle there. Um, uh, 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 other investors that, uh, you know, who are uh, again, another investor who's currently no longer working, but we've learned a lot from is KNC Vasubramaniam. KNC Vasubramaniam, erstwhile Templeton, formerly of Templeton. Now, uh, now I think uh, 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 le leading a very happy retired life in Tamil Nadu. Uh, Siva's taught us again this whole merit of focus on ethical promoters, right? If you, f if you can see in your governance work, your governance research and your forensic research that this is not an ethical house, doesn't matter what share price it's available at, you stay away. You stay away from it. Similarly, Manjunath, uh, Manjunath, who was uh, uh, he's, he runs another PMS in the suburbs of Bombay, but erstwhile very successful in investing with Ward Ferry. Uh, Manjunath again started investing. He actually started investing in the late 80s in the Indian stock market. So nearly 30 years of experience of seeing India through various cycles. Again, this whole point of view on not look for governance, but also keep your eye open for smaller companies where you're seeing the promoter do the right thing. See, once you become a successful large company, then it's much easier to talk a good game on governance and ethics. But when you're at a market cap of, say, 3,000 crores, half a million dollars, and the business just about makes it 20% rookie, and you can see this guy's hardworking, ethical, does the right thing, that's a very powerful signal. Load up early and stay invested for a, for a long time. Um, uh, um, Samit Vartak, uh, I think, does a very good job in small cap investing. I think Sage One and Samit have set a good benchmark on how hardworking, hardworking, intelligent fund managers can do detailed research and, and produce good results for their, for their clients. Um, I also have a lot of admiration for how the folks in Unifi, Unifi in Chennai have built their franchise out. You know, 15, 20 years of methodical work to build a good small cap, mid cap franchise. I think they're getting a mutual fund license. Wish them the very best. Uh, similarly, the folks at Parag Parekh, PP Fast, um, uh, I think Rajiv Thakkar and team have done a great job. Uh, they pioneered this whole construct of having a mutual fund, which invests partly in India, partly in America. Um, watching them do their thing around America convinced us that we too could sit in India and build a global compounders portfolio. So I think we've been privileged to to learn from a whole variety of uh, high class investors and hopefully uh, regardless of how our performance goes, hopefully that learning and the and the benefit of you know of share of getting insights from other super smart people hopefully will get those benefits in the years to come. Yeah, you can't say it, so I will. So I think it's it's clear that you are also. You've earned your place on that Mount Olympus, and and, and I, <laughs> no, and, and and I really do mean that. I I think it's it's. I mean, I anytime I see any interview of yours or something, I, I make sure I watch it. And anytime you publish something written or anything, and there's tremendous value in what you're doing for and so so much data that 
a lot of people may not be able to handle themselves gets sort of simplified but not dumbed down simplification without dumbing it down and present it to us through your writing and i think that's incredibly valuable for anyone who's investing whether they're doing it themselves or they're doing it through you know mutual funds pmss or professionals so thank you very much for saying that we try our best to 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 explain the country to not just foreigners to indians as well the data is available the blogs are available free on our website um on marcelus.in so so those who are watching if you want to benefit from the data the blogs and the insights that are available free the books are available on amazon the cost a little bit um uh, but uh, but we also have a free podcast uh, uh with uh, spotify where we try to again synthesize stuff and i think i think we owe it to the country we've been extremely privileged to be able to live in this country at this time of momentous change uh, uh we've been extremely privileged that 9000 families have trusted us with their money institutional investors in the west are trusting us with their money i think we owe it to the the country to give back whatever we can in in our in our professional avatar there's a csr piece but that's separate in our professional avatar we try to give back uh, at least as much as we have gained from from this remarkable community that surrounds us definitely would recommend listening to your podcast and even there was a podcast you did I forget who it was with where the entire hour was just you explaining how Titan became Titan. Right. I it's a f- absolutely incre- like I I I mean irrespective of what you think of the company and whether you're interested in it or not I think it's an exception I think that that is something that we like required listening if you are an investor. Now the business breakdowns business podcast. Breakdown, yes. I think it's also interesting right see that mode of analysis mm. right I think um my reading is people like Warren Buffett the late charlie munger i think high quality investors across the world i think do that mode of analysis but obviously when you come on popular mass media you can't give that detail so you give a two liner saying at p of 50 i'm buying this stock and that stock but that i think is misleading because to reach that conclusion you had to do a you know a ton of work and business breakdowns gave us the opportunity so we explained titan in the way we had analyzed it hopefully some day perhaps you know we can discuss other stocks like that because i think that's how research is meant to be done and that's how you get the most out of you get the most out of the vibrancy of the indian economy saying that i'm going to buy this stock because p p waisa lagta hai is the most meaning, meaningless thing ever right yeah. but thank you so much sorbet my I, pleasure thank uh, you for hosting me thank you so much absolutely wonderful having you on the show my pleasure thanks rish thank, thank you, you.